Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our online worship experience. This morning, we continue to search for the question of why church? Why is it important that we join these Christian communities? Why can't we just worship God on our own and try to live a good life? Now, first of all, it is good that we have private time with the Father, even family time. But there's also another aspect that God wanted us to have together in coming together as a people and bringing forth worship to Him. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, we see that this brand new community, that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. In verses 46 and 47, it says that they, that day by day, they attended the temple together, praising God and having favor with all the people. There's something that we get in corporate worship that, that we don't get in private worship. It's been interesting listening to people as they've started coming back since this virus and, and since the outbreak that we had, people who've been gone for a long time. And, and there's even been some who've come back and they have tears in their eyes after being with us in worship and, and just how much they missed it. And despite the fact that they were doing the online stuff, there's something different that we get. And it's more than just fellowship. The early church was faithful to come together to worship, even in time of widespread persecution, when it would have been safer for them to just stay at home. But why? Why take the risk? Why, why, why is it so important? That's what we're trying to figure out this morning. So we're going to look at different aspects. The first thing I want to talk about is singing with the community. I read an, uh, an, an article from the University of Oxford about people who are being drawn to these communal sing-alongs that are not even um, religious in nature. And so they, they wanted to know, they set out to answer the question, why? Why are people being drawn to these choirs? Well, we know that people coming together and making music over the years, it's shown to be a strong sense of well-being. It brings about social bonding. The fact that music can be found in all kinds of social settings from religious worship services to football games shows us that it brings forth this sense of community in coming together. In the article, it says... In light of mounting concerns about loneliness and isolation and the increasingly urgent search for solutions, it is fascinating that people seem to be returning to an interest in connecting with one another through singing. The evidence indicates that our singing ancestors might have held a key to better social well-being. Our world has become even more isolated and lonely since the time of this virus. The studies and research have shown it to be the case, which was already a problem before since this age of technology and social networks. But then you add in not just singing together, but the type of songs that we sing. I can't remember the first time I learned Jesus loves me or he's got the whole world in his hands. As a boy, I learned these, these old songs that have come to have great meaning to me. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Peace, perfect peace in this dark world of sin. Lord, haste the day when the faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. As a youth, I learned these wonderful songs at Christian camp and, and youth rallies and youth events. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Jesus is Lord, my Redeemer. 
even the old songs continue to have a great impact on my life, such as, such as how great thou art, the Lord's my shepherd. And now you add the new songs that we've learned in need. Is he worthy? Our God is an awesome God. Our singing is not an accessory. It's not a filler to our worship. It's, it's important to the very sustaining of our souls. In ancient times, many were unable to read and write. Hebrew poetry, like the Psalms, were written in a way that, that people could hear them and, and they hear the repetition of words, they hear these, um, these, these stories and they were able to memorize them and to retell the stories of God. There's something that happens with the, in our soul when we sing these songs together. They just burrow deep. You ever, you ever gone through some major struggle and, and a, one of these songs that we sing as a church comes to mind? Or maybe something positive in your life and, and it comes to mind. It's so powerful. We could go on, but, but we need to keep moving and thinking about this idea of why Worship is so important to us. And I want to look at praying with the community. You know, prayer is an important part of our Christian faith. There's something special in knowing that people are praying for us, that we can call on anytime in throughout the week or otherwise. We're, we're asking people to pray for us. And there's something special, too, about praying with the body of believers, people who... Um, who we, who've come into our worship and they're going through the darkest time of their lives. There's times we've brought people to the front at the very end and we've prayed for them before something major happening in their lives. It wasn't that long ago. We, as a church, we walked across the street and, and we sang and we prayed for someone that no longer is able to be with us physically. God is not looking for professional people to pray either. He's not impressed with eloquence of speech. He's impressed with a sincere heart, which may be eloquent. But some of the most beautiful prayers are those of brand new Christians. Those prayers that are raw and simple and heartfelt. And prayer is not limited to, to the stage, if you will, in our auditorium. People coming in and when they leave our worship, the community talks together and, and we learn about what's going on in people's lives. And, and it, it's, it's great to tell people we're going to be praying for you, but we should stop. And I've seen this happen in our auditorium. People just stop and they pray for them right there because there's, there's something about being physically present with someone and praying for them to let them know they are not alone. But let's talk about being led with the community. This is an interesting thought because in private worship, we are in the driver's seat, if you will. We decide what passages to read, what to pray, when to pray, what songs we're going to sing or even listen to, what truths or applications that we're going to, to think about. But in corporate worship, we respond and we receive by the leading of others. Now, don't get me wrong. Our private time with God is of grave importance. But communal worship demands that we discipline ourselves to respond and not just pursue what is on our minds, not just to pursue God on our own terms. And, and within the community, even outside of our corporate worship, there are opportunities that we have to share. And even after worship, as we talk about various things, I love my, my Psalms study group. It's, uh, I show these techniques and how to read Hebrew poetry. 
But the real beauty of the group is, is that they're made up of all these people with varying backgrounds and varying personalities and, and experiences and education and everything else. And, and they, they bring insight that they share with the group. They bring perspective. And it's just exciting to think about. Last week, Mike McGee mentioned to me that he had, he's fished the stick marsh at least a hundred times. He knows that place very well. He said, but, but then he took a, an airboat ride tour through the stick marsh and he learned things that he just did not know about the plant life and animal life and other things about this place. And he said he gained a greater appreciation. Think about that. A greater appreciation of something that he had gone and spent time with many times before. In personal Bible study, you only hear your voice, but in community, you hear others, spirit-led people and their thoughts. It's in this community that we develop our beliefs and morals. Others can share things that we just haven't even thought about. And yet we go out into our world and most of the week we're out there and it's trying to tell us what is good and bad. We need the body of Christ in order to stay strong in the faith. I've seen Christians, they begin to question and abandon the most basic and fundamental beliefs about God and humanity and ethics after straying away from the church, after straying away from the body. In Psalm 73, Asaph expresses discouragement. He's observing the evildoers of the world and they're enjoying the fruits of their wickedness without punishment. And he begins to question, even following God, is this all meaningless? And then something happened in verses 16 and 17. He says, but when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. He struggled to understand things that did not conform to his present belief system. Because look, we all continue to grow in this, this area. His crisis was the result of having a limited perspective about the world around him. By meeting with God and his people, he began to see things from a divine and an eternal perspective. What happened there in the sanctuary of God? We don't know. We merely can speculate that maybe there was something being read from the scriptures that helped him to see clearer. Or, or maybe it was, it was the rituals that they go through to show the holiness of God and that the wicked will not belong in his presence. Whatever it was, Asaph came to see from God's perspective by meeting at the sanctuary. Let's talk about one more thing, though, partaking with the community. One of the most sacred moments that we have together is partaking of the Lord's Supper. It was instituted during a Passover festival, a family feast that sometimes you invite in the needy and others. And the head of the house, they would say the prayers, they would pass the various cups, and they would retell the story of God's deliverance from Egyptian bondage. It was an occasion of celebration and thanksgiving, and even children were involved. They asked set questions throughout the, the, the feast, and it, it's so that they too would, would hopefully come and to see the faith that the family has. Jesus came proclaiming the kingdom of God, a multi-ethnical covenant family. When he, his ministry began to heat up and the criticism began to heat up as well, his family shows up in Mark chapter 3, and, and they are very concerned with Jesus. They want to bring him back. They think he's lost his mind. And Jesus says to the crowds who were there, he says, Who are my mother and my brothers? 
And looking about those who sat around him, he says, Here is my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Shouldn't surprise us that the, the Passover meal before his crucifixion, he celebrates with his disciples in this family setting, Jesus presiding over at, as the head. And it says, and as they were eating, he took the bread and after blessing it, he broke it and he gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many. For them, at that moment, it felt more like a funeral meal. They just didn't understand, even from everything Jesus had tried to tell them and what he actually was trying to tell them at the feast. We now understand what Jesus was telling his disciples, that Jesus would go to the cross, he would die for our sins, that he paid a debt that we owed and could not pay. Jesus rose from the grave so that we too would not be left in the grave that we no longer have to fear, that we are, are given these new bodies and glorious bodies one day in Christ, this new family emerges. Listen to this family language from Galatians chapter 3, 26 and 27. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Over the next couple of weeks, Peyton's going to be talking about baptism. And, and, and we see that this, this wonderful moment of new birth into God's family. The Lord's Supper. It is a family meal. It isn't set within a funeral because we're on this side of the resurrection. Like Passover, it is a time for the family to remember how God delivered us from our sins. He delivered us from spiritual death. It's a time of celebration and thanksgiving. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul rebukes this one community of believers because they didn't wait on each other. Some were taking of it and, and, and while others came later. And he rebukes them for that because, you see, these elements were not intended to be taken alone. As God's family, here at this congregation, we are going to partake of this sacred meal. Jesus still presides as the head of that table, and he comes and he joins us here amidst the body of believers, God's family. So today we will go to the Father and we will remember our salvation in Christ and we will be thankful and we will rejoice over God's grace and mercy. And in the midst of this congregation, we hope that our children, the children of this church, will be here and they will witness the goodness of God so that they too one day will want to engage in His goodness as well. That's the power of community. Let us pray. Father, we come to you this day and we thank you for your goodness and your mercy and your grace. We thank you, Father, for bringing us together. And together, Father, we pray that you will hear our songs of praise, our prayers of thanksgiving, our calls of, of difficulties that are in our lives. Father, we just thank you. You've brought us together. Father, help us to be ready to receive. Help us, Father, to be ready to, to sit at the table with you as you come and you join us during this sacred moment. And Father, we thank you for all that it means. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.